All right, thank you guys. That was in stereo, no less. Yes. All right, uh, First Timothy chapter number four, if you will. We're going to get uh, started here this morning, and uh, I will apologize to you now. Um, after I'm done this morning, I have a volleyball meeting I have to get to, so I will be exiting rather quickly. So, but anyway, it's good to see all of you. Okay. Yes, sir. Right, I'll shake hands with you. Okay, Dave will take my spot at the door. All right, very good. First, says, First Timothy chapter number four. We're going to uh, come back really and uh, look at a couple things. And uh, pick up from last week where we were talking about suffering and grace. This will be part two. And rather, really it's moving us into some uh, further information. Uh, back uh, first of the year, last year, um, we were talking about his glory in the ages to come. And we laid out a bunch of neat, deep doctrinal issues. And we went over the, the rapture and the judgment seat and what we're going to be doing out in heavenly places. And I want to come back and pick up in that issue and pick up some of that and just go a little deeper with you uh, over the next coming few weeks, really about the issue of reigning, uh, suffering, and so forth, and how, and we're going to start with this this morning, but I want to pick up on what we were talking about last time. Basically, we suffer basically in three ways, Romans chapter number 8, 18 down to verse 25, we are living in the dispensation of suffering. And we suffer because God chose to leave us here in this sin-cursed creation. You know, when you think about the activities of life and why, everybody asks, why do bad things happen to good people? It's because we live in a sin-cursed creation. <laughs> That's why, okay? And, and when you understand that and you can think about it properly, then things kind of tend to be okay in that way. The other way that we suffer is in Galatians chapter 6 when we reap what we sow. When we make bad decisions, what are we going to reap? Bad outcomes, bad consequences. And uh, we always reap more than you sow. You will always reap later than you sow. And you always are going to reap more than what you sow. So when you understand those two basic areas, then you can relax and not get all in a bunch and up in an uproar because, hey, th things in life happen. The third area, though, becomes a little bit more specific. Um, if you will, uh, you got 1 Timothy 4. Just glance back with me to 2 Timothy 2. Uh, we'll have more to say about this passage in the coming weeks. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 12. He says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will... That's not the right verse. 2 Timothy 3. I'm sorry. Verse 12. I, I was thinking about 2.12 because we're going to have more to say about that com in the coming. 3.12 is the third part, okay? <laughs> that didn't, when I was reading, I was like, that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Living godly, <laughs> okay? 3, verse number 12. Yea, and all they, and I'm sorry, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That issue of living godly. And that's the issue that, that really I want to talk about this morning and get us to a, to a point, pick up with and move out into that issue of reigning and so forth. But the issue of living God, yea, all that will live godly. You make a choice of faith in your will to live godly. Second Timothy chapter number 4 here. Uh, by the way, Philippians 1, we looked at last time. We, we're going to suffer, and we suffer for His sake. And that's really the issue. And Peter, he, he's talking to the little flock, and he says, "If you suffer for Christ's sake, don't suffer because you're an idiot and you make bad decisions and you're over here doing something you shouldn't be doing. Suffer for who you are in Christ." And that's really what Paul's saying. The same thing: suffer for His sake. In, in there in, in Philippians one. By the way, in, in Romans eight, in verse seventeen, he says, "If if so be that we suffer." with him and we've talked a little bit about that we'll talk some more about that coming here of, of how is christ suffering today how does that happen today you know he he's not here on the earth no he, the cutting on the lord is only done once but when you look at and consider the passage in the context of romans 8 what are we waiting for to, to wit the redemption of our body what is he waiting for he's waiting for the same thing isn't he so he, we suffer with him in that what are we waiting for we're waiting for the body to be finished and complete and whole and, and the program to move on. He's waiting for the same thing. So when we talk about suffering with him and so forth, 
I want to be very clear. We're not talking about something very abstract. We're talking about something that you can understand, know, love, and appreciate, and then go and live your life in it. And it comes from living godly. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, yesterday in the Men's Fellowship, our, this, was one of our, this was in our topic of godly exercise. But I want to pick up on something here that we talked about yesterday a little bit, but more with you guys this morning. Verse 8, he says, For bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, when he says that, he's not talking about going and working out at the gym or out in the backyard, you know, doing whatever you do to work out. He's not talking about that. Rather, he's talking about the religious activity starting back up in verse 1 and coming down. And, and I always struggled with that. I really did. I'm like, man, how in the world can religion profit you little? Notice how, how much of a profit is it? It's a little bit of a profit. And we had a dear lady here, one, many, uh, she's moved on, but she was a part of our group for a long time. And we were, I was talking with her. She came to understand right division. She uh, come out of the Baptist background. And we were talking with her, and she said, you know, Rick, you're telling me that after 30 35 years of working in the Iwanas and in the mission field among the Indians and seeing kids get saved, that that was all for naught? And I said, no, it wasn't for naught. You, there were some people that got saved. She had a clear gospel presentation, a clear gospel testimony, a, a clear salvation testimony of herself. But what was she doing? She's over in religion, out there working, but there's a little bit of profit in it, okay? And she saw hundreds of children come to know the Lord as, her, as their Savior. And she, that's a prophet. So there is a little bit of benefit there, okay? And, and again, sometimes you've got to stretch to find it. I understand that. And that's okay. But the issue in verse 8 isn't that. The issue is the next. Because what's the next word? But, here's the contrast. But godliness is profitable... So if, bodily ex if religion has a little profit, what has the more profit? Godliness. And it's a profitable unto what? All things. So there's an issue here. There's a contrast being made by Paul. Back up in verse number, uh, verse, oh, where'd it go? Verse 7. There it is. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Godliness is profitable unto all things. Godliness, God-likeness, living life like God would live life if he lived your life. Okay? And that's why I said last week, and I've said over and over again, when we talk about living and we're talking about doing good works and so forth, we're not talking about something special you got to go do. We're talking about in the details of your life, how do you live your life? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about you knowing more about Bible than I know or somebody else knows. Or anything. We're talking about in your life, whatever it is that you're doing, that you're living as who you are in Christ. You're living a godly life. So godliness has prof it's profitable unto all things. Having... The promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. There's a benefit, there's a profit now in time and out there in the ages to come. Now flip over with me, by the way, to chapter 6. And just notice something with me here in chapter 6 about this issue of godliness. <clears throat> Before we move on in the verse, because I want you to understand where godliness comes from. Chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Great gain. Notice what he says. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, their will, their motive, their push is to be rich. What's going to happen to them? Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while, now here's the, here's the effect of this, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Notice what the love of money does. The desire, to, the, the desire of uncontent. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with the thinking how God, God thinks in the details of my life, it, the contentment of just being who I am in Christ is far greater gain than having won the Powerball, 220-something million, the sign said this morning on the way in, and having to then fight to keep it. Now, don't get me wrong. I've heard rich is better than being poor. I'd like to try it sometime. So don't get me wrong, okay? All right? There's, there's a song. I'm in the poorhouse now. <laughs> okay? Anyway, I never got out of it. <laughs> I don't know any better, any different. Anyway, the issue here is the issue of godliness with what? With contentment. Being able to look at the situation and to be content. Now, come over to Philippians 4. And notice how this comes about. Because when we start talking and we start moving in our discussion and in our study, we're, we're, sitting, we're sitting right here. And we're on our life. We're on our walk. To when one day the Lord's going to call us home. Whether it's by death or by the, the gathering together, the day of redemption. One day we're going home. While we're here, we're to have a godly lifestyle. Godliness with what? With contentment. Philippians 4, look at verse 11. Not that I, speak, uh, that I speak in respect of want, for I have, what's that word? Learned. learned. I learned something, didn't I? I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? Content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Abased, poor. Abound, rich. I know. I understand both sides of the fence. Everywhere and in all things I am, what's that next word? Instructed. You see that? Instructed both to be full and to be hunger, hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. How? Does contentment come? You're going to learn it, aren't you? You're going to be instructed. Colossians 2, he says you're going to be rooted and taught and grounded as you've been taught. So in order to have godliness come, in, in other words, godliness just doesn't come because of who you are in Christ. You've got to learn this. You've got to move with it. That's why godliness isn't really being discussed in a, in a doctrinal manner until you get over into the pastoral epistles because you've matriculated down through the edification process and the doctrine to now you take all of that doctrine you've learned Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Corinthians, Galatians, Thessalonians and now you're going to go put it in display in a local assembly and it's going to look like godliness and godliness with contentment is great gain boy to be content it's a lifestyle, by the way. It's a way of, of thinking about things, and it's a way of, come back to 1 Timothy 4, it's a way of adjusting yourself and saying, you know what, everything's okay. There's no, there, and again, I'm not talking about quit your job and go live on the back end of the hill and don't pay, you know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in your life, everyday details. You're living as who you are in Christ. But godliness, verse 8, it's profitable. Having the promise of the life that now is, so right now in time, as I'm going out here, as it does also out here, and I didn't write that high enough, out over here in the issue of the, the to come. Okay? When I have a benefit now, and I'm going to have a benefit out there in the to come. What I do now is going to impact out there. Follow that. It, the profitability now, as we live our daily lives as who we are in Christ, we have victory. We have the peace of God in our lives, in our thinking. When trouble comes up against us, we understand that it, it isn't a, a testing from God. We understand really what it is. We're able to identify it. We're able to move with it. And the prophet is now. Now, come over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
Now I know we've looked at these passages, we looked at them last week, but I'm trying to get them back into your thinking because as we are walking along on our, uh, on our life's journey and trouble comes up, you know, the big T, the process of thinking it through is a pr in, in that process of clearly identifying where the trouble's coming, why it's coming, and so forth, that the issue of godliness comes in and it's got a promise that it's going to be profitable. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 15. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace may, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the, to the what? Glory to the glory of God. For which cause? What's the cause? The cause is the glory of God. For which cause? Redounding to the glory of God, we what? Faint not. We don't stop. We keep moving. We keep pressing forward. But though our outward man perish, got the big T going on, the inward man is what? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What's going on in our inner man? We're, we're learning. We're being instructed. We're being taught. We're rooted. We're grounded. Things are growing in our inner man, Right? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. There it is. The outward man perish. It's just for a light moment. W Notice that next word. What does it do? It works, doesn't it? But what does it work? It works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How you deal with the trouble now and how you process down through the suffering that you're going through, it's going to work for you out there in glory. Or it's going to work against you in glory. Okay? And you're in 2 Corinthians. Come back over. Oh, what's the passage? To 1 Corinthians 4. So the way that we live our lives now, today, in time, is going to impact out over there in our future positively or negatively. And it's the issue of godliness. Are you thinking about things the way God would have you to think? Because if you are, then you're going to have the positive be okay, and you're going to have the negative be less. And if you're not, and you're worried, and you're concerned about what you're going to get and all this stuff, then what's going to happen? It's, the balance will be shifted. Now look, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, and notice verse number 5. Verse 4 is a great one. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. That, you always remember that. You know, we always worry about what other people think about us. Some of us really don't care what other people think about us. Why? Because who's going to be your judge? The Lord is. You know, it's interesting. You hear lost people say, oh, you guys, that, you know, you Christian people, you, you know, you're hate, you do this, you do that. I just sit there and say, whatever. The judge is going to be the Lord, and he doesn't. He's a just God. And if you're not in his son, and if you're not a part of what he's doing, and in his body and you've, you haven't passed through the blood of, the, of, of Calvary, you're on the outside looking in, and I don't care how nasty you get to me, it doesn't matter to that. Who's going to be the judge? The Lord is. Verse 5, Therefore, because the Lord is going to be the judge, therefore judge nothing before the time until what happens? The Lord comes. He comes, doesn't he? With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the Lord himself shall descend. The Lord comes. What's going to happen at that time? Who both will bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. What's he going to do? Well, there's an event at that meeting. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And what's he going to reveal? The hearts of the men are, isn't he? And, notice the, next, notice the and, and then shall every man have what? praise okay so before the judging 
He's, what, what is the condition of men, of the, of the believers? We'll make manifest accounts, we'll, we'll bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and we'll make manifest a counsel of the light of the hearts of men. What's he going to do? What happens at the rapture, what we call the rapture, what Paul calls the gathering together? He also calls it the day of redemption. When the shout and the voice and the trumpet all happen, who goes? Just the dead in Christ first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, right? Who's left on the earth? Unbelievers. There's the bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Who does he leave? Darkness. That unbeliever. Who does he take? That believing remnant, if you'll let me use that term. The remnant home. He takes the believers home, and what happens? Then he will make manifest the counsel of the hearts. We go through that event we call the judgment, that Paul calls the judgment seat of Christ. And what happens on the other side? Every man receives praise. Wow. Now, when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, come over to 1 Corinthians chapter number. So, <coughs> excuse me, I go back to chapter 3. I went the wrong way. When we discuss the judgment seat of Christ, we're not talking about dealing with sin because sin's been dealt with at Calvary back here, which is where you had to be before you could start your godly living. You had to be in Calvary, in, in Christ. So when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, we're not, really ta we're not talking really about salvation from sin because that's already done. But when we fully understand what's taking place at the judgment seat of Christ, we can then take that information... And we can come back here and look at our now living and say, you know what? It's matching right. Or it isn't matching right and we need to fix something. Okay? Follow that. Because the issue in... There, 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 there's seven major judgments in Scripture. One of them is self-judgment. Paul tells, tells Timothy over there... They need to recover themselves from the snare. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, you're to study what? Yourself, aren't you? You're to be studying about you're, you're to be studying yourself. You see, there's a lot of self here. So you take yourself and you say, okay, I need by the way, if you're going to judge yourself, you need a standard outside of you, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah? No? Yeah. <laughs> You know, you go in for the review at work and they pull out the job description and everything you do isn't listed on the job description. <laughs> You're in trouble. They got the wrong... No, you, so there's a self-judgment here. And when you understand the judgment seat of Christ, you can take that information and know where you're at in your lifestyle. Is it matching where it needs to match? Yes or no? It's real simple. Am I matching that issue of godliness with contentment? Because godliness is going to benefit me, not only now, By the way, the benefit now is the peace of God in every situation, no matter what's going on. Because I think about it, I process it through, and whatever the event is, I process it through as who I am in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 is, there are, there are several passages that deal with the uh, with. The, with uh, the issue of the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to just look at a couple of them brief, quick, well, hopefully quickly, but because we've, I've already, we've already gone through a lot of this information, okay? And, and I'm trying to set up for next week, all right? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. If you're laborers, what are you doing? You're working, aren't you? Things are going on in life, activity. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given to, unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In our lives, what have we laid? We have a foundation, don't we? And it's Jesus Christ. Who laid that foundation? Paul does. Romans 16, 25, 
and, and we preach Jesus Christ uh, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And Paul says, I'm the one doing that. I'm the due time testifier. I've laid it, and you need to be careful how you build. And we've been talking about the foundation of grace and building on it and so forth. Why do you need to be careful? Because there's coming a day when the Lord's going to judge everything. And when he judges it, he's going to bring the light to hidden things. He's going to manifest everything. He's going to lay it all out there on the skinny. And then when it's all said and done, there's going to be an issue of praise. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, notice, gold, silver, and precious stones. Boy, those are great things, aren't they? Or what? Wood, hay. And stubble. Now, by the way, read the verse. Notice the verse. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Do you see how you're going to build all six? He doesn't say you're not going to build wood, hay, and stubble. He's going to say you, you're going to. So we got a building going on. So we begin to build, and we begin to lay in things, and we begin to, we, we begin to come along, and we are building. Verse 13, every man's what? Every man's work. So gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble is every man's work. It's activity. It's movement. It's, it's thinking about things in, 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 in a manner. Do you see that? Verse, 14, uh, verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. That's the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment of the, of the Lord. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what, notice what's the word, sort. What kind is it? What's the quality of it? If it's gold, silver, and precious stones and it goes through the fire, what does that do to it? It purifies it, doesn't it? It refines it, doesn't it? So the judgment seat of Christ, and by the way, in your Bible, fire is always related to judgment. Always. Now, I know I say always. Somebody will write me and say, hey, I found a verse. Uh, uh. Well, that's okay. Blind squirrel finds one nut every now and then, you know. Broke clocks twice, at least twice, two times a day. The issue is the sort. What's the quality? Then in verse 14, if any man works abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive. Notice it's a... Reward. It's not rewards. It's not crowns. It's a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall so suffer loss. What's he lose? The part of the reward. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So he doesn't lose his salvation, get kicked out of heaven, and go to hell. He loses that issue connected to the reward. By the, re by the way, the reward, re the reward is that issue of our inheritance, which is the issue of the heavenly places and those positions out there, and that's where we're headed, okay? I'll give you a, heads, a, a teaser for next time, okay? So the reward becomes that inheritance that we've been promised that we have. By the way, the inheritance is not a part of the spiritual blessings in that heavenly place context, it is a spiritual blessing that we do get an inheritance. And we'll look at all that, okay? Ephesians 1 is very clear that we obtain an inheritance by who we are in Christ, given to us by the Father. But what is the inheritance? The inheritance is the positions of the heavenly places out there, who, which is the reward. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's the other passage. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And here's the passage that really we begin to deal with this issue of what's going on here in time. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ is designed to do some things. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Well, I thought we already were accepted of him. Well, in Christ positionally you are. But there's labor. There's work to be done that's going to match the gold, silver, precious stones or the wood, hay, and stubble because at the judgment seat, what's going to happen? That acceptable labor is going to be sorted out. 
And if it's on the right side of the pendulum, it's going to stay. And if it's not, you're going to suffer the loss. Okay? Verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done. I want you to notice the two word, the two letters. Where? In his body. Not by his body. Not for his body. No, it says what? In his body. According to that, whether he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Good, gold, silver, precious stones, bad. Wood, hay, and stubble. But where is it? It's in, isn't it? Who's in you? Christ is in you, but when he says done in his body, that's your body. Who's in you? You are. We're talking about your inner man here. Who's, who, we're not talking about Christ. We're talking about you. 2 Corinthians 4.15 again. The outward man does what? Perish, but the inward man is renewed day by day. It's an in, we're talking about you. When the rapture, by the way, when the rapture happens, we get a new body, don't we? But you are in the new body. The judgment seat of Christ is designed to pure you, your inner man. Not your new body. He's already, you already got the new body. We got to get the inward man done. We got to reveal the things that's going on inside. That's why the judgment seat of Christ is, is the vehicle whereby he, he measures your maturity and your capacity to now go out in the heavenly places and to perform and to do some things and to manifest the exceeding riches of his glory in the ages to come. Exceeding riches of his grace in the ages to come. What you do inside your body now is profitable now and where? In the to come. Why? Because at the judgment seat of Christ, what I did in my body is going to show up. That's why he will tell you. To. In Ephesians 4, you need to grow up and him. You need to mature. You need to learn. You need, in time, we're walking. We're growing. By the way, you're an adult son. Do adults still learn? Oh, yeah. yeah, I do. You grow up. The edification process, everything is designed. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 3? I got the foundation. Let every man build. Right? Where do you build? Did I, am I losing you? You guys are okay? Where am I building? inner man. The judgment seat of Christ, its first goal is to read your maturity level. It reads your inner man capacity by burning away the wood, hay, and stubble, human effort, human viewpoint. By the way, wood, human effort, hay. Hay is temporary, isn't it? Down there where I drive the school bus, there's a lot of hay down there. And you know what they're constantly having to do? Plow the field and make more. Why? Because the animals are eating it. And I'm, I hope it's just the animals eating it. Okay? It's temporary. It's here today, gone tomorrow, isn't it? Stubble. Do you know what stubble is? Not on your face. <laughs> stubble, well, it could be. It's the cheap substitute for the real deal. Okay? But what? So he says, hey, guys, what would you do in your body? Where you're living in godliness, which is profitable now. Where you're building in the doctrine. Where you're learning and instruction. Where you're getting into what you need to know. How to. That's why I said, I've been saying it for weeks now, and actually years. You just haven't been listening to me. I know, I can tell. Okay? But it's everyday life. No matter what you're doing, am I living as who I am in Christ in doing that? I was watching a show last night. A movie, Julie and Julia, Julia Childs. It's an older movie. It's an old movie. Even in cooking, am I doing it as who I am in Christ? Because you know what happens after you cook? What's left? A mess. And somebody's got to clean it up. Right? In cooking, all the way A to Z, am I doing it as? who I am in Christ. 
If I'm not, it's going to be taken care of. What's left? The judgment seat of Christ reads your maturity. The level of maturity you reach now in time while you're studying, while you're renewing the inner man, will impact the level of service, which is what the reigning is all about, is service. It isn't lording over as the Gentiles do. We'll look at all that in the coming days, coming study. It's service. It, the level of maturity you reach now is going to impact the level of service you're going to have out in the heavenly places. So as we grow and as we learn, as we build gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, come over with me to Proverbs 16. Actually, you, you got 2 Corinthians. Go to Ephesians 1 real quick. I, I just want to show you something here. And we're going to touch on this. You're going to see these three show up over and over again. Ephesians 1 in verse number 17, Paul is praying to, for, the Thess for the Ephesians, for the body. And he says in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Okay. Wisdom. Uh, and the revelation in the what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And the eyes of your, what? Understanding being enlightened. You got three things there. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, don't you? And Paul prays that that's what's going into your inner man. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now come to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than... What? Gold. Gold. Look at that. And to get what? Understanding than silver. Do you see how gold is equated to wisdom and silver is equated to understanding? Come over to chapter 20. Chapter 20 and verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are precious jewels. There's your precious stones. So what Paul says is, hey guys, boy that looks like a mess. Hey guys, while you're studying and while you're growing and while you're living life, and godliness with contentment is what is running your life, and, and as you mature and as you move along, and you're building into your inner man wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Next time I'll show you how that's also what he told Adam in the garden. Okay? So, what's happening here? What's the judgment seat of Christ doing to you? It's cleaning you up so you can go out here and have the praise of God, isn't it? That's why... I, I hear guys teaching, oh, you can't do this, and there's going to be two groups, and there's this and that, and then nobody's going to be the joint heirs unless they do this and that. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, but chapter 4, verse 5 of Corinthians says that everybody's going to have the praise of God. So if I'm not a joint heir, then, then I don't get the praise of God? That makes sense to me. By the way, they'll answer that eventually with a twist and a turn and a shake, <laughs> okay, because they do. But the issue here, what's going on? By the way, gold is deity, is it not? Silver, Judas, silver is redemptive money. It's redemption. Precious stones, that's the people. You go to Malachi 3 and he calls a little flock, my jewels. Matthew 27, the silver, the redemption money, 30 pieces of silver. Okay, so there's some very there's a lot of significance to it. My point this morning is is what you're doing now works for you now and out there in the ages to come, and what magnifies it and what brings it to light is the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. Now, what happens is, is everybody says, okay, Rick, but what's your motivation for doing and learning and growing now? Well, it better be, go, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Or 2 Corinthians, um, 
2 Corinthians 5. Because I know what will happen. Sometimes people will say, hey, but wait a minute, you're, you know, you're telling people to go out there and if, if they know more verses and they get no, it's not what I said. You haven't been listening. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 14, for the, what? The love of Christ constraineth us. What motivates you? Not your love for him, but his love for you. The love of Christ constrains you. The love of Christ is what to be the motivating factor is. By the way, if the motivating factor is, I don't want to be in every other name that's named down here, which, by the way, we're going to go back and look at that issue, and you'll find that that issue of every other name that's named is a governmental position. It is a position of authority. I want to be the principality up there. So I'm going to cram it all in, and I'm going to boom, boom. And you know what he says? That's pride, baby. And you know what happens to pride? It gets burned up. because what, And it gets burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. You know why? So that you can then have the praise of God. Because he's dealing with the sort. Can you see the circles? No? Work, now working, praise, glory, the sort. I forgot to move the camera closer. I apologize for the people on the internet, but you'll deal with it. You see, folks, when we talk about suffering and grace, come over with me to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2 now. When we're talking about suffering, we're not talking about... We're talking about more than just what's happening to you, because you, where you live and you make your decision-making process. We're talking about the fact that all those who will live godly, you're going to take in your situation, in the details of your life, and you're going to live godly. And that godliness has a profit. It has a benefit. And the benefit is right here, right now as well as out there in the ages to come. But in that, you're going to suffer. Okay? And the suffering that you're going to take is going to take on the form that it takes on. Because what are you doing? If you're living as who you are, as a husband, as a dad, as a mom, as a wife, as children, on the job, you're going to get ridiculed. There's going to be opposition. Or as a boss, don't forget the bosses. There's going to be people who are going to pick on you. Okay? Paul calls that suffering for his sake. Paul was picked on all the time. For doing what? For preaching the truth. For preaching the word. But he also was picked on when he lived a godly life. It's evident in our study in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, guys, you know how I came in and labored among you and worked? I worked a job so I wouldn't hold you accountable. But yet he still was being hindered. He still had opposition. Why? Actually, the opposition was saying that he didn't come in and work. He actually came in and demanded them to take care of him, put him up at the Hyatt Regency in Scottsdale, give him the, the Lincoln, oh, sorry, the Rolls Royce, okay? That's what the opposition was saying. Paul says, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I came in because I loved you. I was concerned for you. I desired you. Look at 2 Timothy 2 here, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things... For the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Notice, with what? Eternal glory. Now, boy, what a fast, what's a wonderful statement. With eternal glory. That's why in our study about uh, uh, in his ages, his glory in the ages of time, we did that. Glor the God of glory. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now that's a verse that gets everybody's up in a roar. Notice it says, if we suffer, it doesn't say for him, and it doesn't say with him, does it? It just says, if we what? If we suffer. Godliness is profitable now... And where? 
out there and to come. And what are we doing in the ages to come? We're reigning, aren't we? But is there an event that happens between us now and that issue of the reigning? It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And what the judgment seat of Christ does is measures your level of service and ability out there. It graduates you into the job field. It says now you're adequately positioned to do this. And the reason you're adequately positioned to do this service is because you suffered over here. And when that, in that trouble, common to man, God is able to make a way to escape. In that trouble, in that suffering, what happens to you? You go to the Word, you say, Lord, I need a verse, I got trouble. I got... And again, no matter what it is, what's his answer? Yea, hath he said unto me. Philippians 4, the answer is that the peace of God would keep your hearts and your minds. Through who? Through Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. What is the, ver the verse says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him. Well, didn't we read over there about an issue of a loss in 1 Corinthians 3? If you lose the benefit of something, was it denied you? Yeah. You were denied a benefit. You were denied that you could have been a principality, but now you're a power. Instead, because back over here in time, you produced wood, hay, and stubble. And it was, and that's, a, and that's the loss. That's the, the denying. You see, folks, to deny something isn't to say you can't do it because, in the passage, it's because you didn't do something that you sh should have been doing now. The judgment seat of Christ, by the way, if it was something else, the verse in, for, in chapter 4, verse 5 about having praise of God could not be true. If, if, if the denying is to produce a secondary group of citizens in the, family, in the house of God, in the heaven, heavenly places, then they do not have the praise of God. And I know what the critics will say. Well, that's in justification. But 1 Corinthians 4, 5 is not justification. It's walking and it's a judgment at the judgment seat of Christ where the Lord judges. I know I just lost half of you. and That's okay. You think about it. Come back to 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 again, where we started. Make them the circle. <clears throat> i got to find something here. Hang on a second. You got 1 Timothy 4? Go get 2 Timothy 2.15. I'll show you something real quick. 2 Timothy 2.15. The judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to have to make room now, so we're going to lose a piece of the big puzzle. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself. Study to show thyself approved unto God a what? Workman. That needeth not to be ashamed. You see those three components? The judgment seat of Christ comes in and says, what is your educational level? Your level of maturity. Then it comes in and says, were you a workman? What kind of service? What did you do in the body, in your body? What was your service, not only to yourself, but also to others? Because that's what a servant does, is serve others. Ashamed. The third issue is that issue of suffer. What was your suffering? Did you, as you sat at the kitchen table with your family, keep your mouth shut, or did you tell them and then duck, because you knew the bullets were coming? 
What'd you do? That's what the judgment seat of Christ produces. All because, back now back to 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. But if <clears throat> for bodily exercise profit a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Folks, here you start out in your Christian life, And you don't know anything. You're a babe. You're a newbie. And you begin to learn. And somebody comes along and introduces you to how to study the Bible and, and introduces you to right division and introduces you to, to what God's doing today. And you take it and you learn it and you start studying and you start building up the inner man. And then as you begin to go and as you begin to grow and as you begin to get more understanding, then you begin to live it. And then it comes out of you in, in your thoughts and your processes and your decision makings. And then you begin to go forward and you begin to move forward. And then one day you die. Pointed on a man wants to die. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. To be present with the Lord. In that position, you don't have a body. It's just you, your inner man. Your body's laying down in the dirt, in the ash heap. And you're waiting for the day of redemption. And the day of redemption blows, and the trumpet blows, and the shout, and the voice, and all that event happens. And you, you're up from the grave. You come with a new body. But we still ha he still has to deal with you. So he goes, put, processes you through the judgment seat of Christ. And when he processes you through the judgment seat of Christ, he measures the maturity level of your inner man. He measures the level of service that you did. He measures the level of suffering. That, and he sets you. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13 says, Then he takes you and presents you to the Father. And the Father says, Okay, let's see your graduation certificate. And he looks at it. And he says, Okay, your level of maturity, service, and suffering equals this level in the government of the heavenly places. And then we go out for the ages to come, and we serve in that capacity. Now, that doesn't mean we don't stop, that we stop learning. We continue to learn, okay? It just means right now, godliness is profitable where? Now, in the life that now is. Right now. Everything, I told this to the guys yesterday, everything you do right now impacts eternity. Everything. The, the young people, the old people, and all of us in the middle. Everything that you do from this day, how'd you build on that foundation? Oh, I got more wood, hay, and stubble than precious gold and silver and that's okay. It'll be taken care of. You're never going to change that. Who's going to fix it? The Lord at the judge, at when he judges. Now, we're going we're gonna to move forward. We've got all that back in your mind. By the way, all of this this morning was review. Oh, yeah, it's review. Because we're going to move over here and we're going to look at this issue of the reigning and how suffering today plays a part in that reigning issue and put some things together. Go back and look at Adam and Eve and the garden, how where all this gets its start. And, and just kind of bring some things into you, okay? And a, a little bit more information, I hope, that'll be beneficial to you so you can understand. It, it, it's critical to understand 1 Thessalonians 4 and the details of, the, of the rap, what we call the rapture. Because when it happens, it's happening in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and you're not going to be able to say, hang on a minute, what's that verse again? Because by then you'll be there. So you need to have it. You need to understand it. You need to put it in your inner man. It needs to be a piece of what you're learning and rooted and grounded and instructed in right now. Okay? All right. Don't, Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your son. For without being there and being in him, we would not have any position, anything to be able to say or do. We would be all men most miserably. And we thank you for that and the privilege of having your word and the privilege of having your grace to study it, to learn it, and to take it and to apply it to the details of our lives. And no matter what the situation is, 
to apply your life in that situation. And in your name we pray. Amen.